uh, host Ambassador Jimmy Colker uh, as, our, as our lunch and keynote speaker. Um, uh, Ambassador Colker is the Assistant Secretary for Global Affairs at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. He came into that post uh, in 2014 and prior to that served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, in that office for three years. Uh, he's a career diplomat uh, with a very distinguished uh, <clears throat> path. He served as ambassador to Burkina Faso, uh, 1999 to 02, and then in uh, Uganda, 02 and 05, which is a really pivotal moment in U.S. global health engagement with the launch of PEPFAR and, and, and subsequently with the President's Malaria Initiative. And I think, as Jimmy can describe, this had a, uh, a transformative impact on him personally in terms of, of getting his, his full attention and energies focused upon the response on HIV within Uganda that then grew into service uh, as the deputy in the office of the Global AIDS Coordinator back here in Washington after be serving in Uganda, and then a five-year stint at UNICEF as the division, the section chief on HIV and AIDS in New York. So uh, a very, uh, a, a really remarkable trajectory professionally from diplomacy into uh, deep um, global health diplomacy. Uh, the um, office that he heads up has become uh, uh, really a dynamic, uh, focused, focal center of expertise and policy engagement within the U.S. government. That was not always the case. Uh, and we can trace it back, his predecessor, Niels Dallaire, and prior to that, uh, Bill Steiger, both worked very assiduously to build up the capacities. And, in the last several years, it's really blossomed, attracted a multitude of talented individuals, and its influence uh, uh, and expertise have really deepened. So, Jimmy, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Ambassador Coker is going to speak for about 15 minutes, and then we're going to move very rapidly to hear from you. So please think about your questions and interventions, and, I, and I'll moderate that, and then we'll, we'll close at 1 p.m. So thank you. Thanks so much, Stephen. It's really a treat to be here. Thanks to Nellie and CSIS for continuing to highlight questions of universal health coverage. And it's humbling for me to be in a room with so many people who know so much about that topic and about global health, as well as um, many of you who have devoted your lives to bringing us to some of the advances we've made, both domestically and internationally, on universal health coverage. And I. Hope I can at least scratch the surface of some of the work that you all have done and are still doing in, in that topic. Um, my task is to talk about the approach that the United States is taking toward realizing and sustaining universal health coverage. And it's a good time to do that because what we're doing domestically on health reform and expanding access to health insurance coverage is the highest administration priority and it's very significant and I will talk about that later in my talk, but I did want to start with some of the intellect, international and multilateral aspects of universal health coverage, which have been your theme this morning. Margaret Chan, Director General of the World Health Organization, says universal health coverage is the single most powerful concept that public health has to offer. It's inclusive, unifies services, and delivers them in a comprehensive and integrated way based on primary health care. For years, the United States uh, resisted or amended or footnoted any language that talked about um, universal health coverage at the UN or WHO, and there were two main reasons for that. One of them has happily been overcome very dramatically with the passage in 2010 of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. Um, we're now proud co-sponsors of these resolutions and decisions promoting universal coverage because advocating that position is now consistent with and not an implicit challenge to US law and US government policy. But there was always a second reason for caution, and I, just hearing the discussion uh, right before lunch is a good reminder of why some of that caution is still something the US advocates in terms of international language about health coverage. Health systems and health financing are recognized as national decisions and national responsibilities. Even within the European Union, the subordination provisions put health 
into the national realm much more than into the um, community's decision-making responsibilities. And some advocates of universal health coverage have in mind a particular means of achieving the coverage, be it a single payer system, a mutuel, or a government provided national insurance scheme, or as Jeanette Vega raised at the, in the discussion just before and with some good examples because they're so vivid in, in South America right now, a right to health concept in which denial of even very expensive or experimental care can be contested in court. And the US is still opposed to this judiciable right to health. But this debate is quite active, both in our hemisphere and, and globally, and is certainly something that I know you've been addressing in different national contexts. But needless to say, the United States has not adopted and is not likely to embrace in the very near future any of those concepts of a single payer system, a government provided insurance um, scheme for everyone, or a constitutional right to health. And universal health coverage therefore remains a broad concept to be achieved, and we would say in order to uh, account for the slow progress we're making in the United States progressively achieved according to national circumstances. That said, I have yet to be in a meeting with Secretary Sylvia Burwell or before her Secretary Sebelius with foreign ministers of health that in which the delivery, financing, and cost of health services was not on the agenda. Every country faces challenges in rising costs, determining who accesses which services, reaching those who are non-adherent or hard to reach, measuring value for money, and how to integrate, regulate, and leverage private and public provision of services and pay for them. We can no longer talk about universal health coverage just as a supply side issue. Is is health, is health care available? It's not just does coverage exist. Every country and every community is worried about the quality of care, is worried about improved efficiency, and about cost. So the United, in this context, the United States strongly supports a dedicated health goal for the post-2015 development agenda. And all, and all through the negotiations, we've consistently supported inclusion of goals and targets relating to universal health coverage, although indeed this is controversial and sometimes hard to measure. Through the Open Working Group on the Sustainable Development Goals, we'll continue through the summer, and the report of these proposed goals, of course, will be released in July. Many people have questioned whether universal health coverage is the right fit for development goals, but we think it is. As most of you are surely aware, the rise of emerging economies like Brazil, China, and India means that the majority of the world's poor people, the vast majority, now live in middle-income countries. And most traditional development assistance donors limit or prohibit assistance available to middle-income countries. So when we started to look at sustainable development goals, we quickly realized that either these would have to focus on a small and diminishing slice of the world's population, in other words, the low-income countries, or that we needed to think about goals beyond the context of development assistance, which apply not just to middle-income countries, but in fact to the United States as well. We're also aware that looking at trends in global health, an ever-growing share of the burden of disease will come from non-communicable diseases. This is true in both developed and developing countries. And almost two-thirds of global mortality today across the spectrum is due to non-communicable diseases. We'll therefore not be able to meet these new health goals, especially goals about um, greater longevity and diminished uh, premature mortality without the promotion of universal health coverage throughout the world. So the SDGs do have relevance for every country, but this new focus also means that while the original Millennium Development Goals were primarily valuable in helping focus development assistance and low-income country achievements. The new goals will have to have a broader focus. They'll be not as dependent on foreign assistance, but will increasingly be a way to focus priorities for the use of domestic resources. In that context, the dynamic, the sort of paradigm of donor-recipient countries and of development assistance where the US government, for instance, would pay for an international NGO for whom many of you work 
to provide primary care services in developing countries seems already very last century. Countries, certainly the developed and middle income countries, but even those who are the poorest are looking more for technical partnerships than they are for a donor recipient relation. The question we get is how do you do this in the United States? What lessons can we learn from what you're doing there that could help our country? And as um, we heard in the last session, the US should be asking this question more often than we sometimes do, but we certainly are asking the question as well of other countries, in particular in terms of coverage, quality, and cost of, of health care. But within those technical partnerships, coming from the Department of Health and Human Services, it's a sweet spot for us because Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, National Institutes of Health, Food and Drug Administration, Health Resources and Services Administration, even the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, all these large operating divisions within HHS actually have a, a cutting edge role in this. They have a comparative advantage in looking at how can we use our capacity and what we know about healthcare in the United States, about its organization, but also about um, using the latest data and evidence to achieve the best policies, how can those, that capacity and that knowledge be applied to meet challenges that are global challenges or challenges in another country? So we can't lose sight of the need to promote healthy lives through accelerating and sustaining progress on the unfinished business of the Millennium Development Goals, but we really do need to use this 2015 opportunity to look at both domestic financing and the quality of the partnership that the United States, we hope, can provide to countries large and small in terms of how do we jointly solve the challenges and, and problems that confront us in the health area. There, this grand convergence is the, perhaps the most important of health outcomes. We certainly continue our commitment to ending the HIV and AIDS epidemic, uh, creating an AIDS-free generation ending preventable maternal and child deaths. And the statistics on these, again, are, are converging. And that's something that, in which we can all rejoice. And I think the MDGs have a role in that. But there are other priorities that remain universal challenges, sexual and reproductive health and rights, preventing and treating communicable diseases, including malaria and tuberculosis, addressing the challenge of non-communicable diseases, certainly the behavioral causes of non-communicable diseases, ensuring adequate nutrition, access to safe water, sanitation, and hygiene, reducing indoor and outdoor air pollution. And the promotion of universal health coverage will become an increasingly important way for countries to prioritize and deliver on their own health goals and build sustainability of their health achievements rather than universal health coverage as an end in itself. So, what does that universal health coverage goal in 2015 look like? It needs to be accompanied by clear targets supported by evidence-based interventions. It should focus on continuing achievement of current health-related MDGs. It certainly shouldn't ignore the further efforts urgently needed for an AIDS-free generation and preventing child and maternal deaths. And it must be universal in the sense that it ensures that all people, especially the most vulnerable, have access to health coverage. So put simply, 2015 should provide globally measurable goals that would be appropriately applied at local and national levels. National responsibility implies that countries take action in ways that reflect but also improve their domestic conditions. The US is eager to engage with all partner countries and partners, uh, non-government partners as well, as they define packages of essential services. The role of what the UN system calls non-state actors of private sector, of interest organizations, advocacy groups, academic institutions, have grown enormously in importance. And one of the challenges to WHO that we're working on and will be a main subject of the World Health Assembly in May is how does an organization like WHO amass the best minds, the best evidence, the best practice in order to set norms and standards in a way in which there are inevitably conflicts of interest. People have agendas, and people are going to promote those agendas. But how do we make sure that that best evidence, whether it comes from private profit-making organizations which do have interests, or advocacy groups which do have interests, how can that evidence be judged in a way that does not represent a conflict of interest, but in fact will result in the best norms and standards 
and the best partnerships we can achieve <coughs> to provide those, those goals. So we're eager to engage in defining those packages of essential services. We hope that we can help to assure that countries prioritize reaching key populations with priority services, such as those for maternal and child health, HIV and AIDS, and non-communicable non disease prevention and management. We are in a situation where the data and evidence about some of the marginalized populations, for instance, uh, lay, lesbian, uh, gay, lesbian, transgender, and um, intersex populations, we don't know. There is certainly anecdotal evidence that their access to health, their results from the health system are deficient. But we tried at WHO to get simply a authority for WHO to collect evidence on this, and we're not successful. Fortunately, PAHO is now, Pan American Health Organization, is collecting evidence on um, LGBT access to and results from interaction with the health system. But the, in, the violence as a health issue um, is another one where the evidence is very weak. Violence against health workers and the role of health workers in responding to crises and emergencies is an area where the evidence is very weak. So we need to be sure that as we're looking towards sustainable development goals and universal health coverage, that some of these vulnerable groups for whom we don't have adequate evidence also are brought into the, this sense of gathering what data we need to know in order to be sure that our results are improved. We also um, link to sustainable development goals because healthcare costs are one of the primary reasons people are driven into poverty. Development and efficient health financing arrangement supports the government's ability to keep people out of poverty. And universal health coverage is a key to help countries find ways to pool economic resources and risk so people don't have to choose between health, health and impoverishment. And of course, there are many ways for countries to promote pooled resources which have to include private sector systems in most, in most circumstances. So there's a lot of attention, and I say from our side, a lot of enthusiasm around universal health coverage and the many issues that it, it brings up. There's much to be done. There's no easy path, and there's no better example of that than the United States. But it, also our example, I hope, shows that even in tough circumstances with lots of political obstacles, that it's not an impossible road, and that our experience will make that easier for other countries around the world as well. As I'm sure you know, the US spends more per capita on healthcare than almost any other nation, yet we don't have the broadest coverage, and we don't have the best indicators or results. Part of our problem was uneven access to care, especially preventive services. Wellness is the great equalizer, and our health system need needs and needed to reform to deal better with this vital issue of prevention and wellness. Thanks to the Affordable Care Act, the US has taken some decisive steps toward universal health coverage. Healthcare is becoming more accessible and affordable for millions of Americans. Because of the new law, um, we, the, today's statistic, and the government is not keeping these, we're trying to let independent folks uh, calculate, but I saw a statistic this morning that 11 million more Americans now have affordable coverage and reliable access to preventive services, treatment, and care because of the Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act. Before it was passed in 2010, there were about 50 million Americans who did not have health insurance at all. Best estimates are that this number is now well below 40 million, still much too high, but a huge step in the right direction. Our efforts in the US were and continue to be influenced by lessons learned from other countries. Like any historic and transformative change, there are bumps in the road, and we've learned from how other countries have navigated those. The good news is that the reality we now see and the end result, which is more clearly in focus, are worth it. The quality affordable coverage is within the reach of the United States, and we're really pleased that we think we're on the right path and that that path has shown some demonstrable results in, all of, in the, all of the areas of access, of cost, and of quality. Um, in 2012, the Obama administration, for the first time, allowed the United States to co-sponsor a resolution at the UN General Assembly on promoting universal health coverage. 
And it emphasized social protection and sustainable financing as two key components. There are still huge challenges, of course, in those areas, and in a number of others, as I'm sure you uh, touched on in the talks this morning, about what does universal health coverage mean for various things that are perhaps in the penumbra of it. First, do we have evidence that universal health coverage does produce the ultimate outcome of healthier lives? Or is this, it, it's been considered an end in itself, but we have to be sure that universal health coverage is a means to an end and that the outcome is reflected in results in people's longevity and their their ability to live healthy lives throughout the life, life course. And we need to be sure that universal health coverage is especially sensitive to persistent disparities. This lack of data on things like violence and LGBT, but also um, questions of persistent disparities within countries in which the difference between countries is often less pronounced than the, the differences and differences both in results and in coverage access to health and prevention within countries. And we realize, of course, that the universal health coverage shines its light on huge deficiencies which were caused by lack of universal coverage and, and aren't going to be solved by instituting it. But the development of the health workforce, applying it to the highest priority needs, geographic distribution, reimbursement, incentives for serving underserved populations, um, we've certainly been reminded about this in the Ebola outbreak where health workers, uh, for very rational reasons, abandoned their posts rather than, than um, increase the number of people working in the most affected areas because the incentive structure uh, was, was on its head and the sense of protecting and valuing the health workforce itself were not at the fundamental part of the health systems that were responding. Pan American Health Organization was the first regional body of WHO to develop a strategy to promote universal health coverage. Member states adopted resolution and strategy called Universal Access to Health and Universal Health Coverage at the 2014 Directing Council. And that title is worth talking about because to many people, universal access to health, the term access to health, uh, has a very important meaning. And the US, for the first time, did agree to that title, Universal Access to Health and Universal Health Coverage. Um, but the, and universal health coverage implies access to health. But again, this question of judiciable right to health is something that is one of the huge questions, I think, that faces us as advocates for universal health coverage in, in days to come. We also need to look at. Um, some progress that's been made, but clearly not enough on health technology assessments. How can a provider, both an individual provider, a government, a payer, a patient, or a patient's family, look at the technology available and decide what's appropriate for whom when there are very expensive courses of care, when there are options that consequences of which may not be immediately available to the, uh, uh, obvious to the patient or the provider. And, that, and the question of health governance, who makes those decisions, who can reallocate resources, who makes some end of life decisions about, about care based on those technology assessments. These are issues our government has not addressed head on. We have a confusing collection of laws. Medicare in particular is not, um, does not use these sorts of assessments as a basis for reimbursement of providers. And we need to be looking at that and look at how the social determinants and the results are, should be affecting our decision making. There are also, within the multilateral context, some definitional questions. There's a resolution this year which we're supporting, and it seems obvious, but that um, surgical and anesth uh, anesthetics, surgical care and anesthetics be part of primary coverage and part of universal health care. That's true, but it's not actually covered in all systems. The role of mental health is now also recognized as something that needs to be covered by universal health coverage but isn't treated equally by many systems. Dementia and Alzheimer's are a huge issue now. The UK has been leading a G7 effort on dementia. Again, the coverage for uh, sufferers, people with diseases that especially affect uh, elderly people, question of abuse of elders are issues which we haven't as a global or national community adequately addressed. And the same on palliative care. What, what does end-of-life care mean? What sorts of drugs are appropriate for people 
who have terminal conditions and how do we make that process of um, dealing with chronic conditions one that's both humane, medically sound, and uh, financially uh, put in the proper perspective. So in conclusion, universal health coverage is not just a matter of having the government or a third party pay for services. It's a goal to be, we would say, progressively achieved, unique to each society that's aimed at better, more equitable health outcomes across all strata of society. It's both a technical agenda and a social justice agenda and one that we as the United States are ready to embrace. So thanks very much for your interest and leadership on the topic. Thank you very much. I'm going to just move this back so that we're not blocking people's sight lines. Um, what I'd like to do is, is turn to you. I'd like to offer Jeanette uh, Vega the opportunity to kick things off if you care to. Uh, it'd be great also to hear from some of our other guests, from Calypso, Akika, Akiko, Tessa, Sebastian Yacht, Yanzong, some of the other experts that have come. Jeanette, if you could uh, yeah. get things rolling, I'd appreciate that. Thank you very much for your very interesting talk. And uh, really, uh, I think that the international community has been able to see the change in the position of, of, of the US government. We all know how difficult it has been and all the, all the discussions about the Affordable Care Act. However, we do believe that it's quite essential to have the endorsement of the, of the, of the US government. Uh, all of us that we had been in the global uh, arena for a long time, we have dealt with the issue of the very strong opposition of the US for, for several years, so it's, it's good to see uh, that change, uh, that it's a hopeful change. Now, uh, with regards to, to, to your specific uh, talk, I'd like to, to ask um, you about uh, what do you think is, is, is the takeoff of, of the US uh, policy makers and decision makers on the basically uh, advancing towards a more social insurance type of, of protection. Uh, I realize that it's a huge change, but, but there is a fundamental issue that is still remaining. The way that you organize your coverage is still much more on an individual basis as opposed to a population basis. And given that you spend 19% of, of your product in health, with, 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 I would say, not very good results in terms of health indicators. I was wondering, uh, how does your government see this? And, and if there is any sort of plan or ideas on, on, on how to sort of change the situation? Sure, then there are people in the room who are surely more expert than I, but the, the question about social protection, social insurance, how does that relate to, especially in the health sector? The way in which the Affordable Care Act was structured is that lots of things are permitted and there are some financial incentives to create, for instance, accountable care organizations in which people would get together and the providers would be paid by a result that they would achieve for a population or a group together that's a kind of social protection, social insurance that we haven't had in our system before. The, and many of those systems, a lot of them having to do with incentives for paying for results rather than paying for interventions or tests or particular treatments, have in fact now had a track record which is very promising. The question which I heard discussed and I think we all have is how do you then scale up best practices on a national basis or even on a basis beyond that motivated group that, that originated them? And I have to say that we don't in the Affordable Care Act have a clear answer to that question. But we hope that by the fact that this is a transparent process and that these things now are blossoming in many places, that these will be recognized and rewarded and that as we, we have the ability to reimburse providers under various schemes, and Sylvia Burwell I know has talked a lot about this, that we are definitely looking at the way to move over two or three or five years to be sure that we are giving reimbursements based on results, not based on the tests provided or the, the 
the inter individual intervention. So I think there's, I, I think that frame of mind is taking hold, but you're right, we don't have a social insurance scheme in the US and the basic social safety net is of course not stronger now than, than it has been in past years and I think that's a worry to, to many people. So yes, let me, let me just follow up on that because I think that you made a point that is extremely useful and we haven't got into that, which is the point of that in addition to defining the benefit package, one critical uh, issue or critical factor of success is to change the purchasing function. I mean, the, the, because if, even if you define a, an excellent benefit package, but if you continue purchasing using fee per service or ineffective ways of purchasing, not purchasing based on results, but purchasing based on activities, mm -hmm. you won't achieve effectiveness in terms of using the resources to guarantee outcomes. And of course, that could be an another probably seminar or, or a thing. But I just wanted to flag that because that's extremely, extremely critical, the, the reform of the purchasing mechanisms. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, some of our other speakers, Yan Zong. Uh, David, I hope David Granger will join in, jump in if you, if you have some, something. Yan Zong? OK. <clears throat> well, well, thank you, Ambassador, actually. Um, Pleased to hear that uh, the United States is supporting UHC, and uh, of course also delighted that the United States is finally joining this UHC global momentum. But I'm curious, besides endorsing UHC, I expect that is going to happen at the September, the UN uh, uh, Assembly meeting. Uh, what you know, are any substantial or substantive steps the U.S. can be taking to support? other countries, especially those poor countries, to obtain uh, universal health coverage. You know, I, do you envision the U.S. You know, to contribute to a contingency fund, a health system strengthening in general, uh, and UHC in particular, okay. or launch an PEPFI-like uh, initiative to support other countries to build a UHC? Um, the answer is yes, but. The yes is, Clearly, those of you who know Ariel Pablos Mendes, who, uh, who Jeanette succeeded at Rockefeller, but has now been my counterpart at USAID for quite a while, know that he is passionate about this and that USAID has indeed set up a special uh, office responsible for health system strengthening, that this is to be part of our health development aid in those countries where USAID does its health work. Likewise, CDC is seen health system strengthening as one of its core functions within the PEPFAR program and beyond, the global health security agenda, which the president uh, met with 44 countries on September 26th and has now has a huge new um, head of steam because of not only seeing Ebola as the failure of the health security infrastructure, surveillance, detection, and response, but the money that was in the emergency appropriations bill that can go to directly toward U.S. government, and we certainly want partners to be joining in on that, U.S. government help to countries to set up what are now 12 action packages for global health security that include basic lab services, basic detection, emergency operation centers, surveillance capacity, many things that we think would, would help prevent outbreaks and all hazards, um, security threats but are also crucial to standard primary care kinds of responses that, that countries have. So we have, both through USAID and CDC, now more dedicated responses to health systems. That said, and to, to be fair, the PEPFAR program is having to concentrate. They, we had opened lots of doors to health system strengthening as the Global Fund did. Global Fund had a separate window for some of the rounds for health system strengthening. Those windows are not opening more widely and in many cases are closing because the funds are capped and because it turns out the AIDS epidemic or in the case of the Global Fund TV and malaria are not in fact on the dramatic downward course that we hope they could be. And so just the money to maintain treatment and maintain existing programs in AIDS, TB and malaria are gonna suck up 
a higher percentage of money than that could otherwise in the ideal world have been available for health system strengthening. And I, my impression is, I can't speak for others, and I know there's some in the audience, but that most European donors are actually in the same circumstance, that the money for health systems is not only not expanding, but in many cases contracting. So there, people like Gavi, people like Global Fund, UNAIDS, all of us have um, health systems on our periscope and I think are trying to address things that would advance it, but the sense that there's going to be a PEPFAR for health system strengthening or that the world is uniting in a way that's going to make this a, a priority as it hasn't been before, I don't see us moving in that direction at all, and, and that's, I know, disappointing to some people. Why don't we take um, uh, three or four interventions here and then come back to you to respond to those, and then we can close. Calypso, sure, any of our other special guests, Tessa or Sebastian, Yacht, David, uh, we'll come to David after Calypso, yes? Thank you, yeah, thanks for a very encouraging uh, talk. I wanted to check with you what the situation is with um, defining a benefits package in the US. I understand there was an IOM attempt, uh, perhaps a couple of years back, for the exchanges to, to set sort of a, a, a benefits package, but that was mostly ended up being about principles as opposed to substance. Uh, are you thinking you, about you know, I think I missed the key word in what you're asking. What benefits package. package the, uh, benefit, the benefits, benefits package, package. Uh, okay, attempt sorry, to design yeah. a Define, package, yeah, and yeah, I think there was an IOM it. effort. It wasn't there a few years back. Uh, yeah. Thank you. David? Um, thank you. Uh, a comment as much as a, a, a question, but um, you know, the U.S. continues to be um, one of the, the major drivers and contributors of, of um, R&D for new technologies in, in healthcare. And uh, at the same time, you know, the system often gets criticized for, you know, the use of high-cost technologies to the detriment of, of other things. But I think what you've got um, starting to occur now uh, are some opportunities to um, experiment and um, you know, perhaps find some some um, leading ways that can be useful for other countries. And the example that, that comes to mind is a study that was completed last year from United Healthcare, looking at um, payment options in oncology, and um, doing a study that compared two groups of oncologists: one paid on on the traditional fee for service basis, the other paid under a um, uh, incentive basis for adhering to, to quality guidelines, etc. What was really interesting about the study was that the, uh, in, the, in the experimental group, the total costs ca um, uh, came down, but the expenditure on, on innovative oncology drugs went up. And so, you know, it was an illustration that it's not always necessarily about the costs of technologies, it's about getting the incentives right and getting this sort of quality aspect working across the system. So I think you know, that's one of the things that the US can, can contribute to is how do you, you know, how do you manage those things well in an environment that is, um, you know, rich with uh, with um, technological innovation. Thank you. Let's take two more. Keith Martin and and, and Paul. Yes, Keith. Yep. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Ambassador Coker and Rolfes, for the tremendous work you've all done to make the ACA a reality. Tomorrow, universal health care is adopted by all countries in the world. Then what? I think there's a part of the picture we're missing in a great opportunity. In order to operationalize, I think, the public health, primary care, surgical capabilities to address the social determinants of health, not only do we need, they need to have an uh, effective Ministry of Health, but of course, we need to have a Ministry of Finance, Public Works, and importantly, a Justice Department that works. So corruption, conflict, and a lack of capacity is not going to undermine any of those programs we're all talking about here that are going to improve people's well-being. So I'm really interested, Ambassador, in, and if you can give us some guidance as to what's being hap what's occurring to um, sustain, retain, and build the professional capabilities in public services in low-income countries. Thank, Thank you. you. Paul, last, last question. I'm a retired USAID uh, employee. I just had a question uh, on the financing side. I think you've pointed out very correctly that we're all lucky in the public health community that there's been so much additional financing over the last 10 years that's come from traditional donors, Global Fund, Gavi, all these different sources. Uh, what we're now seeing, though, in countries, and I, we've, we've heard today, I think, from a, a number of the successful countries, there's a whole bunch of other countries out there that aren't the Chiles and the Thailands and the, 
and the Mexicos and the Chinas of the world that need to mobilize their own domestic resources. And I wonder if you have any insights about how we as a donor or we as a partner in the global community can help, whether it's put pressure on or whatever is such a way to help countries realize that they have to mobilize their own resources, invest their own resources for their own health systems because, as you've just correctly pointed out, we maybe aren't going to have a global fund for health systems. It's got to, and the money's got to come from somewhere. Thank you. Great. The, the first question, I'm going to declare my ignorance. I'm sure there are people in the room who know more about defined benefit packages than I do. My impression is that it's one of these things that can be piloted, that the Affordable Care Act is permissive in letting this happen. But the, to my knowledge, I have not seen any reports on results of whether that's been successful. Is there anybody here who knows more than I do about that? We'll shelve that one. Yeah, well, sorry, but good question. Uh, and there are many models that should work, and it's one of those things that, as if there are countries that are doing this well, I think there's a real appetite within HHS for finding that out and trying to incorporate that as to something that at least would be permitted under the Affordable Care Act if there are people who want to replicate that. But it's, um, I saw in Mexico, the windows of health that you have with all your consulates in the US has been a, a huge interest to us, and as we've tried to look at what responsibility do foreign embassies have here as employers under the Affordable Care Act, which it turns out they do. What responsibilities do foreign companies that may have their own benefit packages based in their home countries, it turns out that they can get those approved under the Affordable Care Act, but also to foreign people who are here on our soil and people who are dual nationals but maybe under some other system. It's a very complicated issue and Mexico has been our first partner in trying to adjudicate some of these issues and figure out who's, mm -hmm. who's covered and who's not. So appreciate that. R&D and the, uh, as you know, the NIH set up a couple of years ago a new institute. Their only new institute under this administration has been on translational science and the sense of how do we use what we know and apply it. I was talking to the ambassador from Costa Rica that diplomats, and I'm now a diplomat in the medical and scientific world, and that many scientists, if they publish a peer-reviewed article, well, that problem's solved, and if you're a diplomat, that's just the beginning of the solution. You, how do you use that data and evidence to change policy, to change practices, to get our priorities or our, what we think might be a better option onto other people's agendas? And, and the complementary roles of science, because diplomats sometimes do that without evidence, uh, having the evidence is a big advantage. On the other hand, just having the evidence is rarely enough, even, you know, the word that, once the FDA approves a drug for use in the US, um, this goes to some of the mobilizing domestic resources parts too, but once the FDA approves drug in the US, typically it takes seven or eight years before a developing country will be able to market that same drug. And so the, some of the questions about how are we using our research advances, and the question you raised about the cost of drugs going up, but the actual cost of the care going down. One of the things we're trying also in our universal health coverage emphasis within HHS and it, it, multilaterally, bilaterally, is to look at access to medicines not as a zero-sum game. There are certainly people, who, the intellectual property and the needs of poor people for access to medicines are often in conflict, but those aren't those aren't the only, or we think even the major reasons that access to medicine is limited. The national approval processes, supply chain, corruption, as somebody else mentioned, um, a huge number of uh, obstacles that could be addressed. Almost all the essential medicines recommended by WHO are in fact off patent. We just had the um, debate about epilepsy at the last uh, executive board meeting. The epilepsy advocacy organizations were saying that the epilepsy medications, which have been around for decades, cost about $5 per person per year, but two-thirds of the people who need those medications are not getting them. So clearly, this isn't the cost of drugs question. It's a question of what do we mean by access to medicines and how do we look at this holistically and figure out, yes, the cost of drugs is certainly a factor, but what are the other factors and maybe some that we can address collectively or that the US can help countries address and looking at getting the approval process, using science, eliminating counterfeits or, or 
we don't even like the word counterfeits, as you pointed out. Some pe people use that word perhaps incorrectly, but falsified drugs or mislabeled drugs. Uh, and in um, being sure that, the, that our goal is access to medicines and people who need them and using the research for best patient results, not simply putting the drug on the market or publishing the article about it. Um, what to do after universal health coverage is, is achieved with the uh, role of ministries of finance, of the multi-sectoral needs for health. Global health security agenda is addressing some of that in that realizing that there are a lot of stakeholders in having a health system that works, including people who are worried about bioterrorism and people who are worried about um, demo demography of the workforce and, and so on. One of the, again, areas where I think we need to rethink as part of universal health coverage is that health is an investment. Almost every Ministry of Finance sees health exclusively as an outlay. This is an expense for the government, and how do we minimize that expense? I think in looking at it as an investment, certainly in prevention, behavioral prevention for non-communicable diseases, early detection, uh, better surveillance, better lab, better diagnostics and lab work, that all of these actually are cost-effective interventions and that paying for them should be something ministries of finance would embrace and would want to encourage, but we almost never have that dialogue. I give Jim Kim a lot of credit for having a health finance dialogue every year at the World Bank meetings that are coming up next month, and I think this is going to get even more intense as we're looking at that question, health as an investment, retain, build public sector facilities. One of the problems in the Ebola response, again, I'm, it's a little free association here, but one of the problems in the Ebola response was that government's initial reactions were for their health ministries to see this as an outbreak which the public sector was going to respond to. And WHO, for better or worse, enabled that response by being embedded in the health system and talking about a public sector response. In fact, in the countries where it hit, it was non-government organizations, especially Doctors Without Borders, but also some other missionary and NGO groups who provided the bulk of the care, bringing in experts like CDC very early on to look at an incident management, a multi-sectoral kind of response, anthropology, behavior, how do you deal with burials, how do you deal with uh, isolation of patients and, and family responsibilities. All of those were largely ignored because it was seen as something that could be done in a health clinic. And I think as we broaden our view, again, health is an investment, but also that there are a number of things that contribute to better health that aren't necessarily done in clinics or under the authority of the Ministry of Health, and, and we need to build those in. And that, I think, fits right into the mobilizing of domestic resources. As I mentioned, we think, and I'm not sure how many countries have realized this, but that this ambitious sustainable development goals with 17 goals and 170 maybe more targets is essentially going to be the responsibility of each government. This, this is not going to mobilize a huge or you know, quantum jump of additional development assistance for achieving all of these. It's good to highlight so many things, but governments themselves are going to have to prioritize. The good news is that in the global health sphere, the biggest increase over the last three, four years has been in national contributions, including in the poorest countries. That's for the AIDS response, it's certainly been true. But across the board, governments are looking at the Buja Declaration, are looking at their own demographics and health challenges and some of the attention that's being paid to global health and we hope leveraging by our own resources has had many governments take another look at health and PEPFAR is certainly, Kenya for instance, has systematically increased the amount of public sector coverage. The, Middle-income countries, Botswana, Namibia, South Africa, Swaziland, Lesotho, are paying for their own antiretroviral drugs. They're not coming from U.S. or Global Fund anymore. So there, there's a lot of good news on that front, but there's no question that that's going to be the biggest challenge of the next 15 years, is how are, how are we going to mobilize those domestic resources? Thank you very much. Uh, we're at the end of uh, a very rich uh, day, and uh, we owe many people thanks. Uh, uh, Nellie Bristol, uh, thank you so much for all of your leadership and intellectual input and organizational savvy in pulling all of this together. Sahil Angelo, uh, partner with Nellie in pulling this all together. Addison Smith, Katie Peck, uh, thank you both for helping us here. And to all of the speakers, 
uh, Ambassador Coker and, the, and all of the panelists and moderators, thank you so much for coming to make this happen. Uh, we're really very reliant on our friends uh, for being able to have this sort of rich and dynamic conversation, set of conversations. And I hope we can reciprocate in some fashion down the road to all of you. So please join me in thanking all of these folks.